knowing what we now know about DNA and how it's replicated, how it's used to make RNA and how RNA is decoded, we can finally talk about viruses. There's a lot of misinformation out there about viruses. Lots of stuff you have to kind of wade through to figure out what's what. And to do that, of course, the very first thing you need to understand is what is a virus. Viruses are essentially just little packets of genetic material. And remember that the genetic code is universal. So the code that viruses are using is the same as the code that your cells are using. And that allows a virus to trick your cells. We talked about the central dogma of molecular biology in the last topic. And remember that this refers to the fact that DNA can be unzipped into two strands. The strands can be used as templates to make new DNA or to make a messenger RNA transcript that can then be decoded or translated at a ribosome. It's really important that you understand this central dogma. And if the steps don't make sense yet, Make sure you ask me questions and go through your notes again, go through that PowerPoint again, or else viruses really aren't going to make sense. Very briefly, let's review the three components of the central dogma. First of all, we have DNA replication. This is where DNA is going to be unzipped and copied. So if you recall, we have an origin of replication and that's where the DNA is originally unzipped and that forms a replication bubble and then at either ends of the replication bubble we have a replication fork the forks are going to move away from each other the enzyme that's responsible for building the new strand of DNA is known as DNA polymerase it needs to have a template to build off of and also it needs to attach nucleotides to a pre-existing three prime end. So we need a primer or a pre-existing little bit of DNA that DNA polymerase can build off of. Next we have transcription and this is where the message that's found within a gene is going to be transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA, that can then make its way out to a ribosome and be decoded. Remember that RNA and DNA are very similar but we have uracil instead of thymine in RNA, and RNA in our cells is single-stranded. Now we're gonna see that that's not always the case in viruses. This copying of DNA into RNA is done by an enzyme known as RNA polymerase. Finally, we have translation, and this occurs at a ribosome, and here, the message that's found within the messenger RNA is going to be decoded, and it's going to be used to build a sequence of amino acids. Our main focus today is going to be viruses. I'll come back to prions at the end of the topic. I mentioned that viruses are essentially packets of genetic information. So let's start by looking at just how much information there is. Humans, of course, are diploid organisms. What that means is we have two sets of information. We have one set that we got from our father and one set that we got from our mother. If we were to look at a human egg cell or a human sperm cell, the DNA contained within one of those cells represents the human genome. Bacteria and viruses only have one set of information. And let's compare the two. So we'll start with our favorite bacterium, E. coli. It has 4.6 million base pairs of genetic information. And recall that almost all of that is contained in this one great big circular chromosome. And there's a little bit extra in the plasmids. BP stands for base pair. You'll see that abbreviation quite often. A base pair is a complementary pair of nucleotides. So a C on one strand paired to a G on the other, or an A on one strand paired to a T on the other strand. E. coli with 4.6 million base pairs has about 30 times as much information as a T2 phage. Phage is 
short for bacteriophage. Remember, a bacteriophage is a virus that infects a bacterium. And T2 phage is a virus that commonly infects E. coli. Now, it makes sense that viruses don't have as much information. They don't need a whole lot of information. They need information to code for the structural proteins that make up the shell of the virus, and maybe for a few enzymes that are unique to the virus, but that's about it. Now, if we go in the other direction, note that Drosophila melanogaster, a fruit fly, has about 30 times as much information as E. coli. Makes sense, it's more complex, um, and it has to go through a rather complex developmental pattern. There's lots of specialized cells, etc. Now, there's also some junk DNA in the fruit fly. That's DNA that doesn't code for anything. Bacteria are incredibly efficient. Generally, every sequence of DNA in a bacterial cell does something. It has a job. It codes for something. Now, if we go from Drosophila melanogaster to us, Homo sapiens, again, there's a big jump in the amount of information. And you might think, well, humans are a lot more complex. More complexity means we need more information. And that's true, but in humans, we have even more junk DNA. About 96% or more of our DNA doesn't seem to code for anything. And finally, if we compare humans to a canopy plant here, a jungle plant, look how much more information there is in that plant. And that seems rather strange. If we look at other crop plants like uh, wheat and corn, they have huge genomes. And it's not because they're more complex, it's because they have a lot of redundancy. They have multiple copies of many genes, and they have a lot of junk as well. So bacteria, very efficient. Viruses, extremely efficient. They don't have more than they need. Let's take a quick look at the size of viruses. They are incredibly tiny so tiny that it was quite a long time before we discovered them. We discovered cells much earlier. So cells can be seen with a light microscope. In this diagram here in the back, you've got a liver cell, which is a pretty typical human cell. And you can see at this scale, we're just seeing a tiny sliver of it. In front of that, we have E. coli, a pretty typical bacteria cell, but the viruses are much smaller. With a light microscope, you might see a large virus as just a dot. If you want to see any more detail, you need to have an electron microscope. So quickly going through some of these viruses, because they are ones that are rather important. Some of them you will have heard of before. We have a pox virus there. Of course, very important historically within that group of viruses. We have smallpox and cowpox and a few other things. Smallpox is the one that has been most important. It's a very, very deadly virus. Of course, it's the virus that wiped out a large percentage of the natives in North America, unfortunately, when the Europeans first arrived. We have the herpes viruses. This is a big group, causes things like genital herpes and cold sores, also responsible for uh, chicken pox and uh, Epstein-Barr and a few other things. We have T4, you might not have heard of that one. This is a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. And this is one of the best studied viruses because it's easy to study in the lab. We have the polio virus, was a very deadly virus, still is around. It's found in small pockets of Africa and so on. It was very, very important throughout the world in the last century in the 1950s and still continues to be important. Like I mentioned, it's not completely being eradicated, although we do have good uh, vaccines against it. Adenoviruses, this is one of the groups of viruses that causes the common cold. The common cold can be caused by a lot of different viruses, as we'll see. TMV, now you might not have heard of that. This is the tobacco mosaic virus. It infects tobacco plants and causes them to be discolored and unhealthy. And you might wonder, well, why, why is that important? This is actually the first virus that was discovered and studied in detail. We have the influenza virus, which of course causes the flu, which is one of the most common viral infections and does actually kill quite a few people. We'll take a look at some of the other 
characteristics that define viruses and make them different from living cells. All biologists would agree that cells are living. They are, of course, the basic unit, the basic building block of all life. And all living cells have a metabolism of some sort, and they have to fulfill all those characteristics we talked about earlier that we associate with living things. Viruses fulfill some of those characteristics, but not all. They do reproduce, but they can't do it on their own. So first of all, is a virus an intracellular parasite? Most definitely. So an intracellular parasite is something that lives inside a cell and steals nutrients and steals uh, other things from that cell. And viruses can only reproduce within a cell. There are some bacteria that do this as well. One of the ones we've talked about before is chlamydia, a very simple bacteria. Do they have a plasma membrane? Bacteria will always have a plasma membrane. They won't always have a cell wall. Most of them do, but some of them have lost it. Viruses may or may not have a plasma membrane, and I've put a little asterisk next to that because the ones that do have a membrane didn't make it themselves. They had to steal it from a cell. So enveloped viruses, those are viruses that have a membrane around them. They stole that membrane from the last cell that they parasitized. They took a chunk of the cell with them. Can we filter them? Well, we can filter bacteria out of water, etc., very readily, very easily. With viruses, it's not as easy, although it's not completely impossible. There are some filters out there now that will remove viruses. Our filters have gotten better and better and finer and finer. The fact that viruses can't be filtered as easily as bacteria was what led to their discovery. So a man by the name of Louis Pasteur, who you might have heard of, he invented pasteurization of milk and so on. Louis Pasteur realized with rabies that he could take saliva from a rabid animal, pass it through a really fine filter, inject that into another animal, and the animal became infected. And he knew that his filter would remove bacteria. So Louis Pasteur was one of the very first people to say that, look, there's something smaller than cells that can cause infection. Do viruses have both DNA and RNA? No, they have one or the other, as we'll see. Bacteria have both. Do viruses make ATP? They do not. They do not have a metabolism. They have to rely on the metabolism of the cell that they're parasitizing. For bacteria, almost all of them can make ATP. Almost all of them have a well-developed metabolism. One example would be chlamydia, and I think I mentioned this before. Chlamydia are greatly reduced bacteria. They act like viruses in some ways. They parasitize cells, they live inside of them, and they've actually given up making ATP. They steal it from the bacteria that they infect. Are there ribosomes? There are no ribosomes in viruses. There are ribosomes in bacteria. Are viruses sensitive to antibiotics? They are not, but bacteria are. So if you have a viral infection, you should not be taking antibiotics. They won't help you. And also, if you have bacteria in your system as well, you may be inadvertently selecting for antibiotic resistant bacteria that could become problematic. So antibiotics do things like attack ribosomes, they attack the cell wall, etc. things that viruses do not have. Do they respond to interferons? We're not really going to talk about this in this course, but interferons are kind of chemical messages that are produced by your cells that tell neighboring cells that there's a viral infection. And there's compounds that can be created that will attack viruses specifically, but not attack bacteria. And again, with the cell wall, most bacteria have it. Some of them have lost it, but we never see a cell wall in viruses. Here we have a generalized schematic for a generalized virus. In the middle of the virus, we're going to have genetic material. 
Again, this is the most important part of the virus. This is what's going to be injected or absorbed into the cell, and it's going to be replicated and decoded by the cell. This can be DNA or RNA, and as we'll see, it can be single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. But we're just going to have this one type of genetic material. One of the ways we can distinguish between the different families or categories of viruses is what type of genetic material they contain. Around that, we have a layer of protein, this protein coat or capsid that will contain and protect that genetic material. And for some viruses, that's the end of it. Other viruses will have an envelope around them. So enveloped viruses contain a membrane or envelope, which is a bit of plasma membrane that was stolen from the last host cell. And within that membrane, typically we're going to have viral glycoproteins. Remember, a glycoprotein is protein with sugar residues added to it. And typically these proteins are going to be used to attach to the plasma membrane of a host cell. So they're going to be used to enter a cell, and then as we'll see, they also play a role in exiting the cell. So a virus is a pathogenic entity that can infect a cell and hijack the genetic machinery of that cell. Now I'm going to throw a new term at you that you may not have heard of before. That's virion. Virion refers to the complete form of a virus, the form a virus takes when it's outside of a cell. So this is the form that can infect a new host cell. It's going to consist of genetic material, so DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat or capsid. And depending on the virus that we're talking about, there may also be an envelope around that. Now that is the form that can attach to another host cell and get into that host cell. And when it does that, it's going to lose its envelope and it's also going to lose the capsid. And then that naked genetic material is going to be replicated and decoded, so transcribed and translated to make proteins. You can use the term virus to refer to any part of the life cycle of that entity, but virion refers specifically to the complete form of the virus that's found outside of the cell. What you're seeing here are three different virions. First, on the left, we have a bacteriophage. This is uh, a virion that can infect bacteria cells. And then we have two examples of enveloped viruses. So first of all, we have our capsid our protein coat. And you can see in many cases it has kind of a geometric shape to it. Within that, we have our genetic material, our nucleic acid. That can be DNA or RNA. And as we'll see, it can be single-stranded or double-stranded in both cases. And then we may or may not have an envelope that surrounds that capsid. We can categorize viruses based on their shape. What you're seeing here are helical viruses. We have a coil of RNA, and then around that, we have the individual proteins that make up the protein coat or capsid. The tobacco mosaic virus is a good example of this. As mentioned, this is the very first virus that was identified and characterized and also the very first virus to be studied under the electron microscope. In fact, the term virus was coined to describe this particular entity. Ebola is also an example of a helical virus, and you're seeing a very classic image of Ebola here. A number of non-enveloped viruses have a polyhedral shape to them, kind of like a geodesic dome. Incidentally, in this diagram here, capsomere refers to one individual protein subunit of the capsid, and then we have spikes that come off, and the proteins on the spike will allow the virus to stick to cells and gain entry 
into the cells. Enveloped viruses are surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. And this is a chunk of plasma membrane that they stole from a host cell. And it serves to help them hide within your body. Your immune system might not recognize them as foreign because this outer layer is similar to what we see in the host cells. Now note that inside of this, they will still have a capsid and that capsid is quite often polyhedral in shape. Finally, we have complex viruses, which as the name suggests, have a very complex shape. So once again, here's the T4 bacteriophage. This is a virus that infects bacteria like E. coli. It's got a capsid and you can see it's a polyhedral. So it's a many sided compartment. And within that we have DNA, but then at the base of this virus, we have a whole lot of complex structures that are used to attach to a cell and inject the DNA into the cell. There are also several viruses that infect animals like our cells that are complex in their structure. So for instance, smallpox. Note that we have this rather complex arrangement of layers. We've got this inner membrane and we've got an outer membrane. And then in between that, we have these structures known as lateral bodies, which contain a multitude of different enzymes and proteins that are used by the virus to help gain entry into a cell. And then around the outside, we have an additional layer of surface proteins. So to sum up, we have enveloped viruses, which are surrounded by a lipid bilayer. And then we have helical viruses where we have genetic material that's twisted into a spiral or helix. And then we have proteins around that that form the capsid. That helical structure can be further bent and knotted to form the structures we see in something like Ebola. We have polyhedral viruses, and these are multi-sided capsids that aren't surrounded by an envelope. And then we have things like smallpox and rabies and bacteriophages, which are described as being complex viruses. They're complex because typically they have several layers to them, or they have highly complex and specialized structures that are used to attach to a host cell. So we've talked about the structure of viruses. Now let's talk a bit about how they function. So viruses are essentially tricksters. They will trick a host cell into replicating their genetic material and also decoding it to make proteins. What's more is the cell will be tricked into taking those proteins and using them to package that genetic material. So the end result will be a mature virion that can then leave the cell and infect another cell. What you're seeing here is a fairly typical enveloped virus. This is the influenza virus. In the center, we have single-stranded RNA molecules, and each one is surrounded by a helical layer of proteins that make up the capsid. Around that, we have the envelope, and within the envelope, we have a number of important proteins that stick out on the surface. There's two of them that you've probably heard of before, or at least you've heard of the abbreviation. We have N proteins and we have H proteins. The N protein is used to attach to a host cell and trick the cell into taking in this virus particle. The H proteins are used to exit the cell. So you can imagine that these are pretty important proteins, and if they change in any way, that's going to affect what cells they're able to infect. Viruses tend to mutate fairly rapidly, so they can give rise to new strains on a fairly short timescale. And what typically happens is we have changes to the genetic code that will affect the structure of these N and H proteins and result in influenza strains that have unique characteristics. 
they might be able to infect cell types that they couldn't before, or they might be able to infect organisms that they couldn't before. You've probably heard of H1N1, which is a particularly virulent strain of influenza. And the H1 and N1 refer to the particular forms of H and N proteins that that particular strain possesses. Viruses are quite often very specific when it comes to what species they can infect and what tissue types or cell types they can infect. And that's because viruses will bind to surface proteins. And quite often, the proteins that they select, that they've evolved an affinity for, are specific to certain organisms or certain cell types. And you're seeing an example of that here. We have T lymphocytes, so part of your immune system, and we have HIV binding to proteins that are specific to those cells. Let's take a look at the life cycle of a virus. And we'll start with the bacteriophage because they are a little bit easier to understand. They're also very easy to study, so they're quite easy to raise in culture in a laboratory setting. So once again, we have our capsid that contains DNA, and then below that we have a sheath that connects the capsid to a base plate and tail fibers. The tail fibers are used to attach to proteins on the surface of a bacterium, and the base plate is used to basically inject DNA into the cell. On the right, you're seeing a scanning electron micrograph of a poor little E. coli that is covered with T4 bacteriophages. Here you're seeing a T4 bacteriophage in action. It looks almost like a little spaceship, a little lunar lander. The tail fibers are going to attach to specific proteins on the outer membrane of the bacterium's cell wall, as you can see here. Remember that E. coli is a gram-negative bacterium, so it has an outer membrane, it has a thin layer of peptidoglycan, and then it has an inner membrane. Right now, a little drill-like device is coming down from the base plate, and it's going to inject enzymes into the periplasmic space that will break down that peptidoglycan. After that, this tube is extended that allows DNA to be inserted into the cell. Once a bacteriophage is inside a host cell, there's two different pathways or cycles that it can use to reproduce. The first cycle we're gonna talk about is known as the lytic cycle. So again, the very first thing that happens is we have attachment of the phage to the host cell. So the tail fibers are going to stick to specific proteins on the outer membrane. Next, lysozyme is going to be injected into the periplasmic space. Lysozyme is an enzyme that breaks down peptidoglycan. We produce that same enzyme. We secrete it onto the surface of our skin, for instance, to limit the growth of bacteria. In this case, lysozyme is going to essentially make a hole in the peptidoglycan layer. That's going to allow a tube, kind of like a hypodermic needle, to punch through the wall and punch through the inner membrane and allow the phage to inject its DNA into the cytosol of the cell. Now the cell is going to start transcribing and then translating this viral DNA. And it's going to code for proteins that make up uh, part of the capsid and also for some of the enzymes that the virus uses during this infection. And some of those enzymes are actually going to break down the chromosome of the cell. So now this cell is completely focused on reproducing, uh, copying, and transcribing that viral DNA. Now, even though the DNA of that host cell has been broken down, everything else is still intact. So that cell still has 
active DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, active ribosomes, etc. And this cell will begin to decode that viral information. And it will start to use it, of course, to make proteins. It will copy the DNA and package the DNA into capsids using the instructions that were provided by the viral genome. And these bits and pieces will be assembled into mature virions. Now, another thing is happening. One of the genes that was transcribed and translated by the host cell was the gene for lysozyme. And that lysozyme is going to punch holes in the cell. And that will bring about the release of the active virion. So we can start off with just one virion injecting its genome into a cell, and we can have 200 or so virions leaving the cell and destroying and killing the cell in the process. As you might imagine, a viral infection like this can spread very rapidly from one cell to the other, and it can decimate a population of bacteria quite quickly. In fact, there's a number of researchers that are looking into manipulating these bacteriophages to make them more virulent in order to make them more problematic for bacteria that cause harm to us. To recap, the lytic cycle begins with the attachment of the phage to the surface of the host cell. And this is also known as adsorption. If you're taking anatomy and physiology, you know ad means towards, so things are coming together. It also refers to things sticking together. Next, we have entry of the DNA into the host cell. And this is accomplished by a couple steps. So first we have lysozyme that's going to be secreted into the periplasmic space where it will break down the peptidoglycan. Next, that tail sheath is going to contract and force the core of the tail into the cell and DNA is going to be injected through that hollow tube. It's important to note that the rest of the virus stays behind. And at this point, it's sometimes referred to as a ghost. It's just an empty shell. Next, we have expression of the viral DNA. It's going to be transcribed into messenger RNA. And at the same time, the bacterial chromosome is going to be broken down. And that makes sense because, well, if you're a virus, because there's no competition. Uh, all the machinery, all the genetic equipment within the bacterial cell is now dedicated to working on that viral DNA. Next, we have biosynthesis, and this is where those viral messenger RNAs are going to be translated and used to make protein. During maturation, those bits and pieces, the DNA, the capsid, uh, the tail sheath, etc., are all going to be assembled. And then finally, the lysozyme that was coded for by the phage DNA is going to be used to break down the cell wall, and we may have as many as two or 300 virions leaving the cell as the cell is broken down. So that's one way that phages can reproduce, but there is another, and that's something known as the lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle is even sneakier. So it starts out the same way. We have a phage that will attach itself to the outside of a bacterial cell and inject its DNA. But what happens with that DNA is quite different. The DNA is going to be integrated into the chromosome. And at this point, we refer to that piece of DNA, the entire genome of the virus, as a prophage. Now, the cell hasn't been harmed. It can repair that little hole that was punched in the cell wall and go about its merry way. And it will keep doing what bacteria do, which is divide. E. coli, for instance, divide every 20 minutes or so. But every time it divides, 
it's going to replicate that chromosome, including the prophage. So let's say we had one E. coli cell that was going to be infected with a virus, with a bacteriophage. If we were to take that infected cell and grow it up on a Petri plate, the next morning we would have billions of cells that were descended from that infected cell and they would all have the prophage in their chromosome. Once again, though, no harm has been done to the bacteria yet, but there's a trigger of some sort that will occur uh, eventually and it might be a change in pH or some other kind of stressor that will cause that prophage to excise or cut itself out of the chromosome. And at that stage, we enter into a new lytic cycle. So now the chromosome is going to break down and that DNA is going to be copied and transcribed and translated. And the cell is going to fill up with virions and it's going to be lysed or ruptured. The two cycles are linked. However, only the lytic cycle causes damage to the cell. So if you have a virus within your cells that's in the lysogenic cycle, it's lying there dormant. We don't have any active virions that can cause damage. Instead, we just have information. That prophage will only give rise to the harmful form of the virus, the virion, if induction occurs. This sort of thing happens in humans as well. There's a number of viruses that will insert their genome into your chromosomes. For instance, there's a number of herpes viruses that do this. There's a herpes virus that causes chickenpox. If you get chickenpox as a child, damage is being done to your skin cells during the lytic cycle for that virus. But the virus will also incorporate its genome into nerve cells deep in the skin. Later in life, you can develop shingles and shingles is the result of induction, activating those prophages and causing them to give rise to new active virions. Alrighty, hopefully you now have a basic understanding of how viruses function. And we'll leave the bacteriophages behind now and take a look at the viruses that can infect animals like ourselves. Animal cells are different from bacterial cells, of course. One of the big differences is that our cells do not have a cell wall. That can make things a bit easier for viruses. However, unlike bacteria, we have a nucleus in each of our cells with the exception of red blood cells. So that nuclear envelope poses a new problem for viruses. When it comes to entering into an animal cell to infect it, viruses have several strategies, three main ones. Direct penetration. This is similar to what happens with bacteriophages. They directly inject their genetic material into the cell. We can have endocytosis. This is where the uh, virus tricks the cell into eating it, basically. We have membrane fusion, and this is where an enveloped virus simply fuses with the plasma membrane, and then the capsid with the genetic material will be taken into the cell. Let's start by looking at direct penetration. We have a polyhedral non-enveloped virus here. And what it's doing is it's attaching to proteins on the surface of the host cell. Now these proteins are most likely protein channels. So these would be pores essentially that can be used to move things in or out of the cell. It's going to bind to this channel and it's going to open the channel and then it's going to pass its genetic material, DNA or RNA, into the cell. Next, let's talk about endocytosis. Now, if you remember from Biology 111, we talked about a special type of endocytosis known as receptor-mediated 
endocytosis. This is where a cell uses receptors on its surface to bring in very specific items, something that it wants. It could be a large molecule that's too large to pass across the membrane through a channel. Uh, it could be a large food item. Here we have a virus that has proteins on its surface that will bind to those receptors and trick the cell. And note that it's an enveloped virus. So what's gonna happen is that cell is going to be fooled and it's going to engulf this virus. And it's going to form a vesicle, kind of like a food vacuole. Now, if this was a food item, what would happen next is that this material would be broken down and digested. But instead, the viral envelope is going to fuse with the membrane that makes up the vesicle. And then the capsid is going to be dumped into the interior of the cell. Next, that capsid is going to be removed. This is known as uncoating, and that's going to reveal the genetic material. And it can now be copied and decoded. Finally, let's look at simple membrane fusion. So this is similar to endocytosis. We have an enveloped virus again, and it's got proteins on the surface that will stick to receptors on the cell. And it causes the envelope and the plasma membrane of the cell to be pulled close together. When they get close together, they fuse. They're both made of phospholipids. They will mix, of course, and fuse. And what happens next is that capsid is dumped into the cell. Once again, we're gonna have uncoating, and that capsid is gonna be broken down. And once again, we have genetic material that's ready to be copied and decoded. The type of genetic material that's found within the virus will often dictate where in the cell uncoating of the capsid will occur. So you can see on this diagram, our first two examples, membrane fusion and endocytosis, result in the capsid being uncoated in the cytosol. That's likely to be the case if we're talking about an RNA virus, because the RNA can be used directly in the cytosol by ribosomes. Now, if we're dealing with a DNA virus, it's quite often the case that the virus will make its way right to the nucleus before uncoding occurs. And you can see that in the last example. So we have endocytosis taking in this virus. The virus is traveling all the way to the nuclear envelope and actually docking with one of the pores so that it can pass its DNA into the nucleus. DNA viruses will usually enter the nucleus for DNA replication. And that makes sense because that's where DNA polymerase lives. And remember that viruses are going to take over a lot of the machinery that's used in the cell. Also, for some DNA viruses, they may also incorporate their DNA into the chromosomes that are found in the nucleus. RNA viruses are usually replicated in the cytoplasm, but note that for both of these, there are exceptions. And also note, as we'll see, that viruses do contain some enzymes, usually. And if they have to do something special, then they have to bring an enzyme with them to do that. So for instance, there are some RNA viruses that will convert RNA to DNA, something that's never done in a cell and something the cell doesn't have the enzymes to accomplish. When it comes time for the virus to leave the cell, we once again have three main strategies. The virus may release enzymes and weaken the membrane and lyse the host cell. Lyse means to break. So this is similar to what bacteriophages do. As you might imagine, if you have lots of viruses leaving from a cell, they're gonna do a lot of damage. We can have exocytosis this is where the cell simply spits out the mature virions. 
and we can have budding and that's what you see here so in budding the virus consists of genetic material wrapped by a capsid and it's going to leave but it's going to take some of the membrane with it so it's going to bud off from the host cell and notice in this example here we have these special viral glycoproteins on the surface of the cell and of course they were coded for by DNA or RNA that was found in the infecting virus and the proteins that were made within the cell were shipped to the ER and then to the Golgi and then to the surface just waiting for viruses to leave and collect up those glycoproteins in the membrane as they left the cell. A virus that leaves a cell by budding is going to steal a chunk of the plasma membrane and it's going to wear it like a cloak. Remember that the cells in your body have glycoproteins on their surface and they're used for communication between cells and communication between cells and components of the immune system. So it's quite possible that the immune system might assume a virion is part of you because it has the correct glycoproteins on it. Now, in addition to those proteins, there will also be some viral glycoproteins. And quite commonly, those are the proteins that are used to enter into a cell. So these are proteins that the virus uses to trick a cell and to attach itself to a cell. And there's also proteins that they use to leave the cell. We've talked about how viruses can be categorized based on how they enter cells and their structure. But the most important criterion for organizing uh, viruses into some system that makes sense is looking at the type of genetic material they have. So do they have DNA or do they have RNA? Is it single-stranded DNA or double-stranded DNA? Is it single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA? And if they are single-stranded molecules, are they the template strand or the non-template strand? Don't worry, this will all make sense soon enough. There is a great diversity to viruses. They come in many different forms and they vary quite a lot in terms of genetics. And what I'm talking about there is what do they use as the genetic material? Is it double-stranded DNA? That's what we find in cells, but it could be single-stranded DNA. It could be RNA. It could be single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA, which is, of course, something we don't see in cells. We're going to focus on DNA viruses and just double-stranded DNA viruses. And we're also going to look at RNA viruses and retroviruses. First of all, though, how do you interpret these diagrams? These are simplified diagrams of the structure of the virus. We have, in some of these, this dark structure on the outside. That dark structure represents the envelope. So if you see a dark structure, so we have that here as well, we have that over here. These viruses have an envelope. They have this enveloping layer of phospholipid membrane. So this is a membrane that they stole from the last cell that they parasitized. Inside of this, we usually have what's called a capsid, and that's that thin line there. Some viruses are naked. They only have a capsid. So you can see like this adenovirus over here. The capsid is made of protein, and it's a packet, a little container that contains the genetic material. And then we have the actual genetic material, and that's right in the middle of the cell here. So for this example with the herpes virus, we have double-stranded DNA, just like we'd expect to see in a cell. But you can see in some of these guys, we have a single strand of DNA. Don't worry too much about the plus or minus just yet. We'll come back to that. And in some viruses, we have a circle of DNA. So pretty much anything you can imagine, a virus has done it. 
there are some viruses that use RNA as genetic material. That's not something that cells do. Our cells use DNA. DNA is a more stable molecule. We lock that away within the nucleus and the RNA that we have in our cells serves as a messenger or part of the scaffold in a ribosome, right? We have messenger RNA, we have ribosomal RNA, but we don't have RNA that we use as our library of information in the nucleus. We have things like coronaviruses. Of course, there's one that's caused problems lately that we will talk about, but this is a pretty big group of viruses. It contains a single strand of RNA, and then that is surrounded by an envelope. We also have retroviruses. Retro means backwards. They do things backwards. In cells, DNA is used to make RNA. In retroviruses, RNA is used as a template to make DNA, and the DNA is inserted into your DNA. When it comes to the universal genetic code, viruses play by the rules. They have to, otherwise they wouldn't be able to do their tricks. They have to use the same code that the cells they in fact use. However, when it comes to the central dogma of molecular biology, there are some viruses that bend the rules quite a lot. So remember that the central dogma states that DNA is a permanent storage of information. And DNA can be used as a template to make copies of itself. It can be used as a template to make messenger RNA. And messenger RNA is going to be used by a ribosome to make protein. And there are several viruses, DNA viruses, that follow these rules. But there's RNA viruses that have nothing to do with DNA. They don't use it at all. They use RNA to store their information and they use RNA as a template to make more RNA. Even stranger, there's RNA viruses that use the RNA as a template to make DNA, and then they can insert that DNA into your DNA. That process of going from RNA to DNA is known as reverse transcription, because it's the reverse of the usual transcription. DNA to RNA. The viruses that do this are known as retroviruses. Retro meaning backwards. Now also, remember in cells, DNA is always going to be double-stranded and RNA is going to be single-stranded. Well, there are some viruses that use single-stranded DNA as their genetic information. There are some viruses that use double-stranded RNA as their genetic information. So viruses are kind of all over the place. Okay, let's get ready to break some rules. But before we do, just a quick refresher on how transcription works. Here we can see a short sequence of DNA that's been unzipped to allow access for RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is going to read the template strand of the DNA, and it's going to spit out a complementary RNA sequence. Now, it's important to note that RNA polymerase is only going to read one strand. It's going to read the template strand, and there are uh, clues within the promoter. There are sequences within the promoter that tell RNA polymerase which strand to read, but it's going to completely ignore the other strand. If it were to accidentally somehow make a transcript from that other strand, we would get a totally different sequence of RNA nucleotides and thus a totally different sequence of amino acids in the protein that would result. So RNA polymerase is picky. It's going to read just that template strand. Now the other strand, the one that is not read, can be called the non-template strand. That makes perfect sense. But hang on a second here. On this diagram, it's labeled as the coding strand. And that might make you scratch your head. The reason that is, if you look at the sequence of the coding strand, it's exactly the same as the sequence of the messenger RNA that is being produced from the template strand. The only difference between the RNA transcript, messenger RNA, and the coding strand is that in 
the RNA, we have U's instead of T's, but otherwise it's the same sequence. If you can understand what's presented on this slide, you're halfway there when it comes to understanding the genetics of the viruses we're going to talk about. So remember, DNA that's double-stranded has a template strand that's read by RNA polymerase, and then the complementary strand of DNA is referred to as the non-template strand. Unfortunately, there's three other ways to name these two strands. We could also speak of the coding strand, which is the non-template strand. The coding strand is the strand of DNA that has the same sequence as the messenger RNA that's going to be produced from the non-coding strand. All right, let's go on to a third one. We can refer to the non-coding strand as the negative strand. And if we do that, of course, we're going to refer to the coding strand as the positive strand. Finally, the positive strand, the non-template strand, the coding strand, is also referred to as the sense strand. And again, this is because it contains the same sequence of nucleotides, with the exception that we have T's instead of U's, as the messenger RNA. So if we're going to call that strand the sense strand, then it makes sense that <laughs> it makes sense that the template strand is the antisense strand. All right, that was kind of a mouthful. So just to sum up, we have the template strand, also known as the antisense strand, also known as the non-coding strand, also known as the negative strand. And then we have the non-template strand, also known as the coding strand, also known as the sense strand, also known as the positive strand. Hopefully I haven't lost you there. Now I realize that was a bit confusing. To simplify things a bit, I'm gonna limit myself to two sets of terms for the rest of this lecture. So I'm gonna talk about the sense versus antisense or positive versus negative strands. Okay, let's take a look at some examples and we'll start with double-stranded DNA virus. And our example is herpes virus. I'm gonna use this hypothetical sequence for all of my examples. So because this is a double-stranded DNA virus, we're going to have a negative strand and its complementary plus strand. Now remember, the first step in decoding this information is transcription. So this DNA is going to be injected into a host cell where it's going to be transcribed into this messenger RNA. And notice once again that the plus strand of DNA has the same sequence as the messenger RNA. We refer to messenger RNA as plus RNA or sense RNA. Again, that's because it carries the message that's needed to make a protein. And you can see that the plus strand of DNA has the same sequence as the messenger RNA, ATG, CGA, etc., AUG, CGA, etc. Again, the only difference is the swapping of the U and T. Now, using our little decoder ring there, we know that this can be decoded into a protein sequence. So that's translation that's going to occur at the host cell ribosome. And for my really simple little example here, this is the viral protein that's going to be produced. Okay, hopefully that was fairly straightforward. Okay, let's start looking at the different groups of viruses, and there's many, that don't follow the same rules that cells do. And we're gonna start with plus SS RNA viruses. The SS means single-stranded, so we're not dealing with double-stranded RNA here, we're dealing with single-stranded plus or sense RNA. There are lots of members in this group, but I'll just throw out two examples. Our good friend, COVID-19, is 
one of these viruses. And I'm not going to talk much about that today. Hate to disappoint you, but we will come back to that again a few times. And also the polio virus, which is historically rather interesting. It's been pretty much eradicated, but of course it was a big problem in the past. And we'll talk about its effects on the nervous system. And we'll talk about how vaccines for polio were developed and why they were so successful. Okay, anyway, in a member of this group, we have genetic information that's being stored as plus strand RNA. And remember, that means that this RNA has the same sequence that you would expect of a messenger RNA. And in fact, the viral RNA can be used directly to make a protein. Nothing has to be done to it first. So as soon as the viral uh, RNA enters the cell, it's immediately going to be translated. That's going to be translated into our viral protein. Now there's a problem though, because of course the whole point for the virus is to replicate. And that means that not only does it need to make proteins, but it needs to make copies of its genetic material. To do this, these viruses bring along their own enzymes and these enzymes will use that RNA as a template to make a complementary RNA strand. And of course, that's going to be a negative strand. Then that negative strand is going to serve as a template to make more positive strand. And then that positive strand can be packaged into the viral proteins and then the uh, capsid with the um, genetic material, that plus strand RNA will bud off from the host cell. Next, let's talk about negative single-stranded RNA viruses. So here again, we're dealing with a single strand of RNA, but it's not the messenger RNA sequence, it's the sequence that's complementary to that. And an example would be the rabies virus. Rather important historically, as I've talked about before, remember how uh, Louis Pasteur realized from his experiments that there was something smaller than bacteria, and we eventually learned that that was rabies. Okay, so within the rabies virion, we have this sequence. Now this cannot be translated directly. We wouldn't get the protein that we're after. Instead, it's used as a template to make the plus strand. And then that is used as the messenger RNA to make our viral protein. Now we have the same problem that we had before in that we also have to make copies of that negative strand somehow because the virus is going to be uh, packaged with negative RNA. So that plus strand is going to serve as a template to make more negative strand. And then that negative strand will be packaged into the new virions. We have one more example left, and this is the retroviruses. And again, HIV is the best known example. These guys are strange. So within HIV, we have two copies of single-stranded RNA, and it's the plus strand. So it's the sense strand. Now that could be used directly as messenger RNA, but something a bit stranger happens. Instead, this sequence, our hypothetical sequence, is going to be reverse transcribed into a complementary antisense DNA strand. And this is done by an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. This is something that's not in your cells, so this has to be brought in by the virus. If you have reverse transcriptase in your cells, it means you have a retrovirus in your cells. That antisense strand can be used to build the sense strand, and these remain stuck together as a double-stranded DNA molecule. That can be copied the same way that DNA would be copied in your cells, and then these fragments can be inserted into your DNA. So they're integrated into your DNA as proviruses. 
Now, once that DNA is incorporated into your DNA, for the rest of your life potentially, you will be transcribing that pro-virus sequence into messenger RNA. And here's our messenger RNA. And then those copies of messenger RNA will be used to make the viral proteins. Let's take a closer look at the biology of our representative examples. And we'll start with the Popova virus or papilloma virus. This is a virus that causes warts. And sorry to disappoint, but you don't get warts from kissing toads. You get warts, of course, from this virus. Members of the Papoviridae, as we've mentioned, have double-stranded DNA. But what's curious about this is the DNA is circular. It's almost like a plasmid. They enter into cells by direct penetration and they're non-enveloped or naked. Now note that they only infect skin or mucosal cells. Now that relates back to the fact that most viruses are very specific and they are adapted and evolved to attach to very specific proteins. And in this case, they attach to proteins that are only found on skin and mucosal cells. Now they do have potentially quite serious side effects. Some of them can cause cancer. Herpes viruses are also double-stranded DNA, but in this case, the DNA is linear. It's not in a circle. They're enveloped viruses, and instead of practicing direct penetration, they induce endocytosis. It's a large family. There are many different forms that cause a number of well-known and common infections, but they can also cause latent infections. And the latent infections consist of a provirus embedded or incorporated into your DNA. And it can sit there for decades. Just a quick note about enveloped viruses in general. They have in their envelope very important glycoproteins. They're exposed at the surface. And as we talked about, they help to hide the cell hide it from the immune system, but they also act as anchors for receptors on a potential host cell. So they can use these viral glycoproteins to stick to receptors and channels and so on on their next victim. When they enter the cell and are uncoded, that genome is going to be decoded, of course, and used to make proteins. And the proteins are going to form the capsid and other structural parts of the virus. But some of those will make their way to the membrane. They'll pass through the ER and then onto a Golgi, and then they'll be shipped in vesicles to the surface and the proteins will line up with the glycosylated bits sticking on the outside of the cell. When newly formed virions leave the cell, they migrate to areas where these glycoproteins have clustered on the surface. And then when they leave, they steal some of the plasma membrane and they steal those viral proteins as well. The herpes virus family is a large family of related viruses. We have human herpes virus one through human herpes virus eight on my list here. So HHV1 through HHV8. There's actually others as well that I haven't included. But we'll just focus on the top three because those are ones that you've probably heard of, or at least you've probably heard of their effects. So HHV-1 is also known as herpes simplex virus one. And for the majority of people, it causes cold sores. So sores on the lips. It damages the outer layers of the skin, the epidermis, and creates these open sores. In 90% of the people that have this, it just causes cold sores. In 10% of people that have this, it can cause genital herpes. Then we have HSV2, which is very similar, and the effects are similar, but the proportions are, are switched around. 
So in this case, 10% of people that have this get cold sores, 90% get genital herpes. Both of these can be spread by uh, kissing and also sexual acts. Next, we have VZV, the varicella zoster virus. And this causes chickenpox. In older individuals, it can also cause shingles. Another one you might have heard of is the Epstein-Barr virus causes infectious mononucleosis, the so-called kissing disease. And then, like I said, there's a whole bunch more on top of this. These are viruses that can cause latent infections. And although there are medications that can reduce the risk of induction and the appearance of symptoms, if you have HSV1 or 2, there's a good chance that you're always going to have some of that DNA, so the provirus, embedded within your own DNA. Herpes zoster virus causes chickenpox in children. And the infection in children tends not to be that serious. The problem is this virus will embed its DNA as a provirus into the DNA of peripheral nerve cells deep in the skin. That information stays there and it can stay there for your entire life and it can pop out later via induction and cause shingles. If you have chickenpox later in life, I unfortunately had it when I was about 21, it tends to be far more serious as well. But the concern, of course, is that you may have this inside your cells just waiting to pop out. Now, there are vaccinations that can prevent children from getting chickenpox, and those are very popular now. They're a very good thing. Uh, and also there are vaccinations for shingles. So if you've had chickenpox before, you can take that vaccination that will prime your immune system. So it will be ready if induction occurs. And finally, the retroviridae or retroviruses. These are sense single-stranded RNA viruses and that genetic material is in straight or linear pieces. They're enveloped viruses and they enter through membrane fusion. What makes them highly unusual is that they have this enzyme reverse transcriptase that allows for reverse transcription. It's able to take RNA, use that as a template to make double-stranded DNA that can then be integrated into the host cell DNA. HIV attacks helper T cells. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about the immune system. But because they do so much damage to these cells, they make an individual with HIV very susceptible to failure of the immune system. So it's not the disease itself that can potentially be deadly. It's the fact that by losing these helper T cells, you are going to suffer a great deal from other infections that otherwise would not be a serious issue. HIV has a lipid membrane, an envelope, and beneath that we have a shell of proteins that make up something called the matrix. Beneath that we have our proteinaceous capsid, and within the capsid we have two strands of RNA. Also within the capsid we have three enzymes, although only one is shown in this diagram. We have reverse transcriptase, which is responsible for reverse transcription. Again, not something that would normally happen in a cell. We have another enzyme known as integrase, not shown here, but integrase will take the DNA that's produced by reverse transcriptase and then plunk that into the DNA of the host cell. So it's going to integrate the DNA into the host DNA. And then finally, we have an enzyme known as viral protease. A protease, also known as a proteinase, is an enzyme that breaks down protein. What happens in this virus and quite a few other viruses is that instead of there being many individual messenger RNAs that are transcribed from the genes of the viral genome, we have some very long messenger RNAs. So the genes are all very close to each other 
And instead of RNA polymerase uh, transcribing one gene at a time, it transcribes a whole big long sequence. That great big long messenger RNA contains information from several genes. That big long messenger RNA is turned into a great big long protein and then viral protease comes along and cuts that up into the proper sized proteins that can then be folded to make the components of the virion. To summarize, the virion is going to attach to helper T cell specific receptors on the surface of the host cell. And this is going to bring about the fusion of the envelope and the plasma membrane. The capsid is going to be dumped into the cell and it's going to be uncoated. That's going to release the special viral enzymes and also the RNA. The RNA is going to be reverse transcribed by reverse transcriptase. So what's going to happen is reverse transcriptase will come along, grab onto the RNA molecule, read along it, and manufacture the complementary strand of DNA. So it's going to build this single strand of DNA that will remain attached to the RNA for a brief period of time. So for a brief period of time, we have this hybrid molecule that's one strand RNA and one strand DNA. Reverse transcriptase will then remove that remaining strand of RNA, a few nucleotides at a time, and replace it with DNA so we get a single DNA double-stranded molecule. That DNA can then be integrated into the host DNA. So the DNA is going to move to the nucleus and be integrated into DNA that's found on one of the chromosomes. And we have a provirus. That provirus is going to be translated, and as I mentioned, it's going to be translated as a few very large messenger RNAs. They're going to go out to the ribosome and they're going to be translated to make some very long polypeptides. Those polypeptides need to be cut up because they are too big and the proteins that result can then be pieced together to form our new virions that can then bud off of the helper T cell and go infect other helper T cells. Of course, the RNA will also need to be created, as we talked about, and that needs to be packaged within the capsids before the virions leave the cell. And I'll throw one more family at you just for good measure. And don't worry, I'm not expecting you to remember the name of this group. It's orthomyxoviridae, and it includes the influenza viruses. And that's why I want to touch on it briefly, because it is such an important group. But we will come back to these again when we talk about how viruses can mutate, how they can change, and how they're spread. These are negative, single-stranded RNA viruses, although the RNA is found in several pieces. They're enveloped, and they enter the host cell by endocytosis. There are several different forms of influenza, and once again, like most viruses, they're very specific when it comes to what species they infect. I mentioned before that we have two very important groups of proteins displayed on the surface of influenza viruses. We have neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. These are shortened to N and H proteins, and those are much easier to say. The N proteins facilitate the release of the virions from the host cell, and the H proteins uh, allow a virus to attach to a host cell. So without the H protein, they can't get into a cell and infect it. And they come in different forms. There's nine known forms of the N protein and 16 of the H protein. When new strains pop up, that microbiologists are concerned about, it's generally because these proteins have mutated, or perhaps we now have a new combination of these H and N and other proteins on one virus, and we haven't had that combination before. So you can imagine, as I mentioned, if we change these proteins, change their shape, they might bind to different receptors now, and that means that they might 
allow for this virus to infect different cell types or different species. And we can actually get combinations of proteins that are found on viruses that typically infect different species. But it's possible for some mutated viruses to inhabit the same host and to do a bit of trading in terms of genetic material. When your cells are duplicating your DNA, they're quite careful about it. There are several different types of DNA polymerase, and some of them will go along the DNA molecule after it's been replicated and look for mismatched pairs and look for errors and correct them. Viruses don't have that luxury. When your cells are replicating viral DNA, they are more likely to make mistakes and not double check or proofread. Also, the enzymes that are sometimes packaged with viruses aren't very good at proofreading either. So mutations, mistakes, pop up in viruses quite frequently. Now, usually those mistakes are going to be detrimental to the virus. They're gonna stop it from working. But occasionally, we might get a little tweak that gives the virus a new spin, a new skill, and maybe it'll start doing something more damaging, more harmful, more uh, virulent. Also, as I mentioned, if we have co-infections, so we have two different viral species infecting the same animal, we can get swapping of bits of DNA. So imagine you have two influenza viruses, different viruses infecting the same cell. Well, the DNA sequences might get a bit mixed up. The proteins might get a bit mixed up and you might end up with a new virus that we've never seen before. In this example here, we've got ducks and poultry that are being farmed in close contact with each other and in close contact with wild birds and in close contact with humans. And in a situation like this, there's a lot of opportunity for mixing of bits and pieces and the creation of something brand new quite quickly. Before we leave viruses, I have one final question. And personally, as someone who's really keen on biology, I think this is one of the most interesting questions in biology. Where did viruses come from? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe they are a simple form of almost life. Maybe they are related to the first cells that appeared. So maybe they're pre-cells, not quite cells. They're a leftover from four billion years ago. That would be a pretty sound hypothesis, but actually the truth is far more interesting. In our cells, we have bits of DNA that are known as transposons. This is a short piece of DNA and it codes for a protein. And the protein it codes for, all it does is cut that piece of DNA out and move it somewhere else. So we have a transposon that codes for the enzyme needed to move the transposon to another piece of DNA. These are sometimes known as jumping genes or selfish DNA because they reproduce on their own for really no reason, just because they can. They move around in your genome and occasionally cause problems. So occasionally they will insert themselves into a gene and turn that gene off. I mentioned that we have a lot of junk DNA. Most multicellular animals do. And in part, that's because of transposons jumping around and messing everything up and turning off some old genes that fortunately we had duplicates of. It's kind of a mess. And it's thought that these jumping genes gave rise to viruses. So imagine adding a few more genes. Even if we just added a couple of genes that would allow for the creation of a protein coat by the cell. Now we have something that's more durable. It can be even more selfish. So this thing exists because it can. It exists because it's good at tricking the cell it's in to make copies of it. So multicellular animals appear to have given rise to these parasites. They're bits of their own DNA that are now parasitizing them. What's even weirder is there are retro transposons. There are transposons that can 
um, code for enzymes that will transcribe them and then copy them back into DNA and insert them somewhere else. Really a fascinating topic. I would be rather remiss if I did not talk about COVID-19, the virus that's been causing us so many issues over the last few years. The name comes from coronavirus disease. The 19 specifically comes from the year that it was first discovered. Corona means crown. You can see the crown on a bottle of Corona beer. So the virus has a crown of spike proteins that help it gain entry into a host cell. So those spike proteins will stick to receptors on your cell and induce your cells to take in the virus. Somewhat interestingly, the sales of Corona beer went up considerably during this outbreak. The COVID virus has an envelope and embedded within the envelope are spike proteins. They stick out on the surface and they will attach to receptors on the cell and trick the cell into taking in the virus by endocytosis. For their genetic material, they have single-stranded sense RNA. COVID-19 can have an effect on cells throughout the body, but it has a bigger impact on the cells that line the respiratory system. These cells have a receptor known as the ACE2 receptor. This is a protein that binds to the surface of the cell and it responds to signaling molecules released by your body that tell the alveoli to stretch a bit more, tell the passageways in your respiratory system to dilate and allow in more air, and it also tells your capillaries, the ones that lead to the alveoli, to dilate and allow more blood flow into the lungs. So when this ACE2 receptor is there and it's functioning, functioning normally, it receives signals that allow you to better oxygenate your blood. However, when COVID-19 binds to this receptor, that receptor is inactive. And also the receptor gets taken into the cell along with the virus. So there's fewer of these receptors on the surface. So the whole point of binding to this receptor is to gain access into the cell, but the effects of that receptor are lost as well. So you have breathing issues and you have blood oxygenation issues. Once the virus comes into the cell, the RNA is released and the RNA is copied and the RNA is used to make proteins and the virus is assembled within the Golgi. The virus as it leaves steals some membrane and the virus is released, released by exocytosis and it goes on to infect neighboring cells. Again, blocking of those ACE2 receptors will lead to constriction of the blood vessels, the very, very tiny capillaries that lead to the alveoli. We have reduced blood flow, but at the same time, because the tube is now much smaller in diameter, we have increased blood pressure. The blood is being forced through a smaller tube. More fluid will leak out under pressure, and the alveoli can fill up with fluid, something known as pneumonia. This can destroy a lot of the immune cells that are wandering around in the alveoli, things like macrophages. It reduces the ability to take in oxygen and dissolve it into the blood and also can lead to other infections. It makes the alveoli more susceptible to things like bacteria. Over a very short period of time, several vaccines were developed for COVID-19 and these were messenger RNA vaccines. Messenger RNA vaccines have been in development for quite a long time contrary to popular belief. This was the first time they were used on such a large scale though. So with a messenger RNA vaccine, what you do is you take messenger RNA that codes for a small part of the virus, you put that into a little packet that can be injected into the body and taken up by cells. And that was the big stumbling block, figuring out a way to get this messenger RNA into cells without it being destroyed first. Once this viral messenger RNA gets into your cells, your ribosomes will blindly decode it. And again, that's because the code is universal. 
they're going to make a protein out of that. And the messenger RNA that has been injected codes for the spike protein of COVID-19. The spike protein will move to the surface of the cell and it will be displayed. Your immune system will recognize this protein as foreign and produce antibodies against it. Now let's say you actually encounter the real virus. That virus will have spike proteins on it, of course, and these antibodies will stick to it. So your antibodies will stick to the spike proteins and that will stop the virus from attaching to your cells. It also identifies the virus as something foreign and your immune system will attack it and destroy it. Unfortunately, there have been a number of misconceptions as to what the point of vaccination was and what the point was to self-isolating and wearing masks and social distancing. Let's start with the vaccine. If you are vaccinated, you can still get sick. That's the case for any vaccine. You can still take in the virus. You can still breathe it in, of course. We're not gonna stop that with a vaccine. And it can still damage some cells before your body is able to respond to it. If you have been vaccinated, your immune system gets a head start. You already have some antibodies flowing through your blood you already have a population of B cells producing those antibodies. If you haven't been vaccinated and you're exposed to a virus, it will take some time for your body to make the antibodies and just get started launching a response. If you've been vaccinated, you will be able to get rid of that virus much quicker. It still might create some symptoms, but the symptoms will be greatly reduced and more importantly, in the case of COVID, you will be infectious for a much shorter time period. The period in which you can spread it to other people will be greatly reduced. If you're wearing a mask, that is going to help protect others. <clears throat> it protects others more than it protects you. When you cough, you are releasing great big droplets of fluid and those are gonna get stuck in the mask. The air you're breathing in already contains some uh, viruses that are basically just tiny particles floating in the air. You might be breathing in some viral particles, but you're not shooting out too many of your own. And with social distancing, of course, again, you're less likely to infect other people. But the whole point of all of these things was never to protect healthy people. Healthy young people are unlikely to have serious side effects due to COVID. But there is a segment of the population, the elderly, people with coexisting um, infections, people who are morbidly obese, have diabetes, etc. These people are far more likely to be affected by COVID and those are the people we were trying to protect. The other thing is, and you've probably seen this before, this whole idea of flattening the curve. The idea was that if we social distance and do all this, the disease will spread more slowly. It's still going to infect a lot of people. It's actually going to be around longer because we're delaying these infections, but we never get to a point where we overwhelm the hospitals. And that was key, especially in the beginning. If we had just let things run their natural course, everyone would have gotten infected very quickly the infection would have been over faster, but people would have got infected very, very quickly and the hospitals would have been overwhelmed. We would have seen a lot more loss of life, not just from COVID patients, but from other patients that couldn't be admitted to the hospital because the hospitals had reached their capacity. Did these measures save lives? Most definitely. I think everyone can agree on that. What's more debatable is how many lives were saved. It's thought that close to 7 million people died of COVID-19. Depending on who you talk to and where you get your numbers from, it's a very difficult thing to estimate. There may have been somewhere between 10 and 20 million lives saved. Now it is very difficult to estimate this because people that died of COVID-19 for the most part had other problems. They had other issues, but COVID-19 was the last straw. These are 
vulnerable individuals that couldn't deal with COVID-19 as well. Is it worth saving 20 million people? I think so, but not everyone does. This is kind of a personal thought process that you have to go through. There are roughly 8 billion people on the planet. 20 million is a fairly small percentage of that. It did have big impacts on the economy of the planet. It increased rates of depression and so on. So it is a very tricky topic to address. I think it was quite amazing that all the countries of the world came together to stop the spread of this disease. Microbiologists, pathologists were waiting for something like this. This was not entirely unexpected. We had an outbreak of the Spanish flu back in 1918 that killed 25 million people. Population of the planet was quite a bit lower then, so that was a significant chunk. And we were just waiting for something else like this to happen. These kind of respiratory diseases pop up every few decades. A serious one pops up every 50, 60 years or so. So yeah, it, it, it's quite interesting that everyone managed to work together on this. We did save some lives. It's going to be interesting seeing how this pans out going forward with other outbreaks. COVID-19 certainly did cause a lot of disruptions to our personal lives. It caused a lot of inconvenience. And your view on whether or not that was necessary probably relates to whether or not you have family members that were in potentially infected groups. Myself with elderly parents that were quite susceptible to respiratory illnesses, I was on board with all of these uh, precautions. But again, it's going to vary depending on how it affected you and on your personal views. And now for something that might be even more fascinating, prions. Prion stands for protonaceous infectious particle. And this is an infectious agent that's far simpler than a virus. This is an infectious agent that doesn't have a genetic code, which is bizarre. I can't think of any other entity that can reproduce that doesn't have a genetic code. Even a computer virus has a code. These are proteins that can bind to other proteins and change their shape. They're responsible for a few rather rare and poorly understood diseases. This poor sheep that you're seeing here is suffering from scrapie. Now, it looks like this disease is causing fur loss or wool loss, I guess, but actually that's not the case. What's happening is this protonaceous pathogen is found within nerve cells that are found just beneath the skin. So peripheral pain receptors, for instance. And they're damaging those cells, interfering with how they would normally function. And this poor little sheep is in quite a lot of pain. So its skin is burning. It feels like it's on fire. And what they do is they rub up against walls and fences and basically rip the flesh off of their body. Prions are responsible for bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which you probably know as mad cow disease, and the human variant of this, which is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, CDJ. Alrighty, so we have a protein that has gone rogue. It's got an abnormal shape, and when it comes into contact, with cells, it damages them. That doesn't sound too out there. That doesn't sound too unusual. It sounds a bit like it's acting like a toxin. However, I told you that this abnormal protein can reproduce. How the heck can that happen? Well, let's take a closer look at that scrapey example. What you're seeing on the left is a protein that's found on healthy nerve cells. This is its normal configuration. If you remember back to Biology 111, we talked about the complex way in which proteins are folded. The brown spirals here represent alpha helices, and the kinky arrows 
represent beta pleated sheets. On the right, you're seeing an abnormal form of this protein. There's very little change in the sequence of amino acids. Instead, it's being folded differently. And you can see it has a very different shape. And as you might imagine, it can't do the same things that the normal protein does. But this is where things get weird. This abnormal form of that neuronal protein will grab onto the normal protein whenever it encounters it, twist it around, change its shape to match itself. Imagine if you could do this. Imagine if you could go out on the street, grab a stranger, grab his face, twist it around until he or she looked just like you. After a while, everyone would look like you. Is that reproduction? I would say so. I mean, you're making copies of yourself in a really unusual way. You can imagine that if this abnormal protein is found within nervous tissue, after a while, there might not be much of the normal protein left. The abnormal protein will replace the normal protein. But there's more to it than that because the abnormal proteins stick to each other. So not only will the abnormal proteins replace the normal proteins, but they'll stick together in long chains and form these plaques or deposits that will cause further harm to the cell. It's kind of like what we talked about in sickle cell anemia. Remember, if we have hemoglobin that's misshapen, it can stick together and form long chains and interrupt the functioning of the red blood cell. Now there's one more thing that's really weird about this, if it wasn't weird enough already. This is perhaps the only disorder or disease that is both heritable and transmissible. Something that's heritable is something that involves genetics. It's something you inherit from your parents, or perhaps during your creation, there was a mutation in the DNA that combined to create you. Transmissible refers to the fact that we're dealing with an infectious agent. So if you get the flu, it's because a flu virus was transmitted to you. Well, prions can show up in your body by either pathway. Let's say you have a gene for this particular protein. Remember, it's supposed to be found in its normal configuration on your nerve cells. Let's say you have a gene for that protein that is mutated. And it's mutated in such a way that you get the abnormal form. Well, if that happens, you're going to have problems. But alternately, let's say that you consume some nervous tissue. And that nervous tissue contains these prions that are misshapen. And they travel to your nervous uh, system grab onto the proteins that are found there, the normal proteins, and change their shape. You would end up with that same unfortunate condition. Now you might be wondering, how would you ingest nervous tissue? It's not something that most people consume. Well, let's say you're eating a T-bone steak. That T is part of the vertebrae. And as you've probably noticed, there's a little hole that contains a little bit of soft tissue, and that's the spinal cord, and it could contain prions. Now, I should say it's incredibly unlikely to contain prions. This is a rather rare, as in extremely rare, condition. Or it could be that you're eating some sort of ground meat that contains a little bit of nervous tissue. And you really don't want to have a prion disease it leads to chronic progressive wasting of the brain. And there's no known cure. There's no recovery. It's a one-way street. There's no initiation of immune or inflammatory responses. So normally, if you have an infection with a bacteria or even a virus, there's some sort of immune response and there's increased blood flow to the area that brings white blood cells, etc. That doesn't happen. Immunosuppression doesn't make the condition worse, which it would if we were talking about viruses or bacteria, so I guess there's that. They're very tiny, 
very small structures, and there's none of the structures that we would expect to see in a cell or in a virus. There's no nucleic acid, there's no code. These are things that can be found in very, very high concentrations or titers in susceptible tissue. They do not elicit an interferon uh, response, which would occur with a virus. So really, your body has no way to deal with these things. Prions are incredibly resistant. They can survive cooking. They can survive ultraviolet radiation, alcohol, formalin, boiling, enzymes. It's pretty amazing. In fact, the only way to destroy them in a lab setting is with steam autoclaving or other very harsh treatments. Of course, that doesn't really help you if you have them in your body or if you have them in your food. I don't think you're going to autoclave your food. Again, though, I want to point out that these things are incredibly rare. I love my T-bone steak. I eat the whole thing, including that spongy little bit. So what do prion infections do to you? Well, the name for one of these infections is transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. And let's break that down. So encephalon means brain or head. Pathology, of course, means a disorder or disease of, so something is abnormal. Spongiform means having the form or shape of a sponge. A sponge, of course, has lots of holes in it. So we're talking about this transmissible pathogenic agent that can cause your brain to become like a sponge to fill up with these little microscopic holes. And that's what you're seeing in these histological sections. So you can see there's these white areas where there should be cells, but there's not. That normal protein is important for maintaining healthy cells. It's not there anymore. And in addition to that, the abnormal proteins have linked up to form these harmful plaques and the cells in that area have died. We have BSE, bovine, which means cow, spongiform encephalopathy, and then we have the human form of that disease, creutzfeldt jakob disease. And there's some debate as to whether or not these are distinct variants or whether they're actually the same thing. We have scrapie that we've talked about, and a new one here, kuru. Kuru is rather interesting. It's something that's exceedingly rare, it was a bit more common in the past, and it was most common in natives of New Guinea that were still practicing forms of cannibalism. They would eat the brain tissue of ancestors and enemies, and they would pick up the prions, and the prions could pass through the digestive system, pass through the circulatory system, and infect their nervous tissue. These are terrible diseases. They cause a wasting away of the brain and there's nothing you can do about it. In Kuru, for instance, people that have this quite often stop sleeping. They don't sleep for a month or more before they die. They laugh uncontrollably. They basically have a mental breakdown, which is rather unpleasant. More and more prion diseases are being identified, not just in humans, but in other animals as well. But again, note that they are quite rare and also very poorly understood. We have a few different forms of human prion diseases here. You can see they affect different parts of the brain and that's because we have different proteins that identify those different areas of the brain and those proteins can go bad. Well, that was a rather long topic and a rather technical one at that. Very quickly, going over the concepts, you should be able to explain to me why viruses are not generally considered to be alive. Again, that's something you can get into a debate about depending on who you ask, but most biologists will say, no, they don't quite fit the definition of life. Why is that? Some viruses contradict the central dogma of molecular biology. Remember that this tells us that DNA is the long-term repository of genetic information. It's used to make RNA, which is then used to make protein. But some viruses break those rules, and you should know which viruses do that and how they do that. Viruses are obligate parasites. 
they don't have a metabolism of their own. They can't do anything. If they're outside of a cell, they're completely dormant. They do nothing at all. They need to hijack a cell in order to get anything accomplished. Some viruses can integrate their DNA into the DNA of the host cell, and that results in a latent infection where we have a provirus in the genome of the host cell. And things can stay like that in a dormant state for decades. Cells that are enveloped steal plasma membrane from their host, and they use that to hide inside the host and also to enter other cells. Now note that they don't use the plasma membrane to maintain homeostasis. There really isn't any homeostasis in a virus cell because again, they have no metabolism, they have no source of energy to do anything, to do any work. Prions are very weird. They are proteins that have changed their shape or conformation they can bind to the unaltered forms and change their shape so that they match their own. And this is a very odd way of reproducing. They can be both heritable and transmissible. And here's our terminology list. So you should be familiar in addition to these terms here with the genetics of DNA viruses and RNA viruses and also retroviruses. And I may have a question on your final exam that also relates to how HIV replicates. So make sure you're familiar with these life cycles. Oh yeah, and there's some study questions.